Well, these two will have no idea the chaos that is now unraveling behind them over about 15 to 20 kilometers of northern France because the race is spread over at least that distance now as the riders continue. Looking right up into the distance there, we can see the remnants. It's probably Vogels trying to get across here. Uh, that's Franco Ballerini's group coming across now with Tom Steele, so they've almost closed it down on the two leaders. That's right. Uh, I've forgotten we got to the front then, Paul, but that's right. And these three are coming up now, so the gap was 52 seconds. It looks to be, what, 30 seconds now? And this is going to be an amazing chase back too for Steeles and Rick because they must have thought their chance of heading this race again had gone today. But up comes an express train in the form of Franco Ballerini and carrying them now up towards these two leaders. Ludo Dirickson must be very happy that he's changed off the smaller teams that he represented over the last few years and now riding on top of the, the first division squad, Lotto. It gives him a chance to race with men like Andre Schmiel and this afternoon he's certainly waved the flag for the Lotto squad but now he must realise that things are about to change because the race is becoming a, a much more critical event now because the riders starting to come into the crucial closing stages of Paris-Roubaix and coming up from behind pretty rapidly indeed is Franco Ballerini and not far behind a very strong group with Frederic Moncassin. And if they all get together, it'll be the status quo and they'll all have to start and try and work out the tactics once more because some nasty stretches of cobblestones very much still remain here as we get into the last 50 kilometres of the race. We've crossed the town of Atiche and we're now heading down towards the next sector of Parve. These two riders still will not give up. They're still surviving, looking over the shoulder now. They can see just at the end of the straightaway behind them, Franco Ballerini, Tom Steeles and Michael Rich. And they go in now to the next section and it will be interesting to see just how powerful Franco Ballerini is and if he's going to close it down personally on the two leaders. Well, Rick is not at all happy on this section of cobblestones and neither is Tom Steeles. But you can see from the helicopter now, that's in the middle of the picture, is Ballerini. He has catapulted across. Tom Steele's off to our right, but Ballerini has flown and caught the two leaders. So we now on zone 10, with uh, 10 more sections of cobbles to go, Paul. Ballerini has reached the front of the race. What a remarkable comeback, but that's what Paris-Roubaix is all about, never giving up, always keeping your morale, even if you have bad luck, crashes, punctures, mechanical incidents, you always have to insist on going forward, continuing with the battle, and that's what Franco Ballerini has done now, he's fought his way back from a rear guard action after the Forest of Arenberg, picked his way right through the field, gone with the right groups, and now he's found himself right at the front of the race once more. But he has been so immensely strong today, he has now put the two leaders, Gouvenou and Dirickson, under pressure, it looks like immediately Gouvenou is cracking here, Dirickson is hanging on just about, but Ballerini seems to have taken the conscious decision to go for home so soon. Well that's the thing you have to do when you ride for a squad like Mappé because any one of those riders in that squad have a great chance. Tom Steeles, he's done his job for the day, all he's going to do now is just try and get to Roubaix in a large group without too much difficulty because there's still the World Cup rankings to think about in a race like this, you have to make sure that three riders from each team finish, Steeles a long way back there's Michael Rick this is the section of cobblestones which takes them over the motorway and in front of Rick there you can see is Thierry Gouvenou so it looks as if Ludo Dirickson is just hanging on for grim death onto the back wheel of Franco Ballerini there are the two leaders now and very shortly they should take that left hand turn over the motorway bridge well they, he must have wondered what on earth came up to him here but Dirickson has done well to just hang on I can't believe he's going to hang on for much longer because Ballerini is looking for no help at all he's Rick picking up Gouvenou so even Michael Rick, who has had his bad luck today, is still riding immensely strongly here. As uh, in the distance there, we can see Tom Steele's as well. Now they're also on zone 10. Ballerini's about to exit zone 10 here. Dirickson no longer willing to work, if indeed he can, uh, with the man from Mappe. The man, which is very strange, Francesco Moser is one of the other great Italians who love Paris-Roubaix, but there aren't many come from Italy who relish these cobbles like Franco Ballerini does. Certainly don't. Italy have only won Paris-Roubaix nine times before, and one of those men who took three victories was Francesco Moser. So it's not a race that normally smiles on the Italians, and it has been a love-hate relationship for Franco Ballerini over the last few years. In fact, when he finished second to uh, Gilbert Duclos-Lasalle, he was beaten in a photo finish. He walked away from the stadium and said, I'm never coming back to this race again, but he's been back every year since. Absolutely, and well, today, maybe he's going to repeat the win again, which he's had already once in this event. Now, 
There's the open cobblestones as uh, our valiant cameraman today are rushing around like rabbits here to try and keep up with the way this race is fragmenting and fragmenting every few seconds. Ballerini now off zone number 10 takes a look at to see who has still stayed with him. The answer is only Ludo Dirickson and a question of for how long because we're now heading to zone number 9. Well, Ludo Dirickson did a good job there surviving. At one time, he was three or four lengths just behind Franco Ballerina, and I was convinced he was going to crack. He knows how important it is now to try and stay with Ballerina, and he has done that. And there, Ballerini signalling to him, come on then, if you can stay with me, you can work with me. I can't believe that Dirickson can do anything right now because this man has been the lead since Saint-Quentin. And uh, what Ballerini wants to do is make him work, fry him and leave him. And uh, if Dirickson's got any sense, he'll stay right where he is right now. Well, in the back of his mind, he's probably thinking about Ducla La Salle because Gilbert Ducla La Salle at that time was 39 years of age and he played the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a poor old man, I can't work with you. But when they got to the finish line, he just had enough strength to come by Franco Ballerini in that sprint. So I would think if Ballerini's thinking about going all the way to the finish now, he must certainly want to do it alone and must, even though... Ludo Dirickson has been at the front of the race for a long time, want to try and get rid of him. As we hit zone number nine, there's the other point too, Paul, isn't there? Because of the nature of this race with the cobblestones, you never know when bad luck comes to you. You certainly don't, and there are still nine sections of cobblestone still to go, as you said, and it could well be that he'll have Dirickson sitting on his wheel for the next 10 or 15 kilometres. He'll build up a lead of one or two minutes over the chasing group, and then he could break his bike, so he would much rather try and find himself in the lead on his own so that if there is any chance of a, a problem, he can recover nicely. Well, we're on zone nine, and it looks as though Ballerini's content to set the pace, and Dirickson still has the ability to follow here. He seems to uh, ride his saddle very lowly, Paul, uh, low down, doesn't he, Dirksen? He certainly does, but you can see the power of Franco Ballerini there, sitting on the bottom of the handlebars. He's got massive power in those thighs of his, and that's the only way, really, to ride over the cobblestones, to keep the speed up as high as possible, because you do float over the surface of these cobbles, and once you start to weaken, then you hit every one. Well, that's a reaction by Mappé. Yeah, as it has to come off the cobblestones here, they're trying to rid themselves now, the two Gan boys and the two riders from Rabobank, which I can't see at the moment, but I presume, oh, there they are, just tucking into our picture. So they are actually now, they, they almost as if they feel confident that Ballerini is going to win this race, and now they're trying to do a 1-2-3 like they did a couple of years ago, which I never thought we'd ever see again. Well, Andrea Taffy there going on the front, having been led onto the cobbles by Wilfred Peters. What they're trying to do, I think, is put Frederick Moncassin under a little bit of pressure. Peters has drifted off the back there after that little acceleration of his. Frederick Moncassin with the black hair on the front, Magnus Backstead in second position. And the two Rabobank boys not doing a whole lot of work in this group. Well, Backstead is a name I've never before mentioned in commentary, and today this man has been a true hero of the race, done so much for his teammate Moncassin. He certainly has. He's been a great find, I think, for Gann. He was four times the champion of his own country at the time trial, but this is the way they went onto the cobblestones. That was Wilfred Peters trying to sort it out, and Backstead now has been put to the front by Frederick Moncassin to do all of the work to try and pull him back into this race. And a great find he is for Gann because uh, not only did he win the Grand Prix of Isberg last year, but two years ago he won the Boland Bank Classic, winning a stage there. And that was the first time I saw him back in 1995 where he won two stages. And one of them he in fact rode away from the main field, which was made up of mainly professionals from TVM and Onse. And he held a 20 second lead for the last 20 kilometres and they couldn't pull him back. Well, this nasty little stretch of cobblestones are sure to be swinging her pin left to climb up to the main road on the left shoulder here. But Ballerini has managed to persuade Ludo Dirickson now to get out front and do a bit of the work. And they don't blame him on this stretch of road, at least he can see where he's going. There's the hairpin bend and there's the chase group as well. And the race now swinging back on itself here uh, before it heads off to zone number seven. So the race is still really on a handkerchief. Anybody could win. And if Franco Ballerini falters slightly, he's got two men in the chase group behind to pull him back into the fold. Well, the Mappe have salvaged something out of this race. All they want now is the result. And despite the fact that Patrick Lefebvre, so disconsolate coming out of the Forest of Orenburg, saying, I've lost my two top men. Well, he seems to have forgotten Tom Steele's, Wilfred Peters, Andrea Taffy, and Franco Ballerini, because those are the men who could still shape this race up for Mappe. 
Here's Thierry Gouvenou leading them round that hairpin bend with Michael Rich. And just a little bit further back, I'm fairly sure we'll see the big chasing group now made up of the two GAN riders, two Rabobank riders, and the two riders from Mape. And there they are, some seven riders here. Tom Steele's hanging on the back. He's uh, got rubber legs, I think, now. Tom Steele, the champion of Belgium, left-hand circuit here. And we're behind Tom Steele's now as we hairpin ourselves away up to the top. And, uh, There's a problem there, Phil Baxter put his hand up on that section of cobbles there, in fact Tom Steeles has got problems too and that's with his gears, his chain has come off and he's trying to get it sorted out and you can see there's always a helping hand here in the north of France here in Paris-Roubaix to get somebody up and running, there's Baxter stopped on the right hand side of the road, so that's a bad move there for Frédéric Moncassin because he's lost the big engine that was helping him. Well, I think Baxter has punctured uh, just as he came off the cobbles there, and we saw the chain was off from Tom Steele's. He's got it back on, but he's in his highest possible gear here, and he's making my legs ache as he climbs up. There's what happened. His chain comes off as he came out of that corner, and all he can do is stop. And on the other side, you see, it is a flat tyre there as the Mavic service car gets up alongside Baxter. You just never know when bad luck strikes here in paris Bay, and now he has isolated uh, Fred Moncassin. And I think Tom Steeles is a spent force there, bearing the sequel of his crash earlier on in that section of cobblestones near mont pavel And I think all he can hope now is just to survive to the finish. The two leaders, though, still looking very comfortable. Dirickson still able to feed himself, keep himself uh, topped up with energy because there's still an awful lot of racing to go before the finish. And now Franco Ballerini not asking for any help, just happy to ride on the front and set the tempo. The Italian-Belgian tandem here at the front. And he's through another nasty stretch of cobblestones. And behind now, he'd be unaware that the chase group has been weakened by the loss of Backstead. I don't think it's been weakened by the loss of Tom Steeles because I think Tom Steeles was weakened as it was. Uh, but these two riders now are still heading down for the last 45 kilometers of racing. And uh, the only man left to worry about for Ballerini now, and he must be worried about him, Paul Ludo Dirksen, because Belgians, we know, are very tenacious bike riders. They certainly are, and especially when it comes to a race like Paris-Roubaix, which everybody wants to win. It's not called the Queen of Classics for nothing. And so if Dirksen can just sit on the back wheel of Franco Ballerini for a few more kilometres and keep eating and drinking as he was doing just a little bit earlier, he can recover. But Ballerini looks very concentrated. The face on him is just thinking about keeping the speed as high as possible so he should make sure that he doesn't get into one of those zones where you forget and you feel that you are superhuman you can ride anybody off your wheel because if he gives Dirickson the chance he will do everything he can to recover and there's the signal he wants him back round again now and uh, in fairness uh, Dirickson doesn't hesitate he drives through and gives Ballerini a spell at the back well, I wouldn't like a Ballerini behind me right now because you get the feeling this man is going to sprint away and put in a huge attack at any moment as we're heading up now towards a zone number seven. Still seven very, very bad stretches of cobbles to come. Certainly is a huge rider. He's paid an awful lot of money by Mappé and a lot of uh, Italians say that he's not worth the money because he only wins a couple of races a year throughout his career. He's never been a major prolific winner. His first year in 1986 he didn't win anything at all, then in 1987 he won one, one victory, 1998 one victory, 1989 two, and then he had a great year in 1990 with five wins, but since then he's been winning a couple of races here and a one race there, but never really the super winner. But he's won some big races, Paul, and he's Mr. Consistent when it comes to the classics because he's always in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth or sixth positions in these one-day classics. And he's had the lot in Paris-Roubaix, he's been a pass winner, he's had second, he's had third twice. So he certainly knows this race inside out. Two Mappe boys on the back of that group there looking happy. But this is it, look at that, Franco Ballerini has dropped Ludo Dirickson on this very long uphill rise. Well that's amazing, but it came, he made him work you see, and you could see on the face of Dirickson he was suffering, and now he's turned the screw that little bit tighter, and we're on zone 7 here, and Ballerini is bouncing away on his own now. He still has the best part of 27 miles to go to the finish, and that to me is a long way under normal circumstances, I'd say he's mad, but the way he's left this race spread eagle, he's got to have a real chance now. He certainly must feel confident because that's about an hour and 10 minutes of racing still to go and he's made a great comeback since the 
Forrest of Arenberg with 60, kilo, 60 miles remaining. He's leapfrogged from group to group to bring himself back to the front of the race. So he's obviously used an awful lot of energy, but he will know every inch of the running now from here to the finish because this rider from Mape has ridden this race so many times before, but it also in the last couple of weeks, he will have been back here too to make sure he can check the cobblestones and see just exactly which way they're going because nowadays the last 60 miles of Paris Bay is a very complicated affair with the high speed train that's been built across this area. The race actually has to zigzag around north of France to look for cobblestone sections like this. Well, look at the wet on the road there now as Michael Rick is at the front here. I think it's Leon Van Bon. No, it's not. He's trying to get up behind him. But you see, what's happened here now is it's every man for himself now. They're, they're hardly riding in a bunch anymore as they pick their way through the mud here on the cobblestones. They'll almost be unconcerned about who is in the lead at the moment. It's a matter of survival. I think Rolf Sorensen said it best before the start this morning when he said when you come to the final stage of Paris-Roubaix it really is a question of every man has to ride for himself even though Magnus Baxter is doing what he can to help Frederic Moncassin it's a question of riding for yourself looking after yourself because all of these teams have been reduced in numbers there's no such thing as teamwork anymore it really is every man for himself and uh, it's Baxter first followed by Rick uh, followed by Sorensen Thierry Gouven who is back here now so too uh, just behind him we've got Fred Moncassan so at least Baxter got back up to this group he must have been quite a chase and he's still strong enough to put the pressure on here as he's caught out Rick and uh, Sorensen but uh, Moncassan quickly pedalling through I'm going to try and give his young teammate a hand here because I have to say Baxter's wonderful and look over the back there that's the remnants of that 20 man chasing group and they're still in the picture they still are very much in the picture. This race is quite strange for the moment. We have Franco Ballerini going out on his own at the moment, but these groups behind only separated by uh, about 30 or 40 seconds each, so the race could all still very much come back together. But I hope, to, I hope we don't get treated to a big punch sprint on the track in Roubaix. It's unthinkable, surely, right now. Henk Vogels is back in that group, and if they could get across here, he'd be a good ally for the two boys from Gann in this chase group. Michael Rick just cracked there on that section of cobblestones, but Thierry Gouverneau there in fifth position is really doing a storming ride. He's managed to get into the slipstream of the riders that have caught him up, and he'll hope that he can survive now over the section of cobblestones because I would think that's the only place that he can get dropped on the cobblestone section because that's where you really need to ride with all of your force. And on the back of that lead, that group of riders now all of the time the two riders from Mape they won't do anything at all now to the success of this breakaway they'll just hope that Franco Ballerini can start to build up a little bit of a lead and even if he does get caught it'll be up to them to do attack fueling up for the last 40 kilometers or so to ride for Franco Ballerini this remembers his 10th Paris Bay he's never failed to finish this event and the majority of his finishes have been in the top five places so Franco Ballerini now free as a bird, he's got rid of everybody, he's leapfrogged stage by stage till he caught the last rider, Ludo Dirickson, who has now been dispatched backwards towards that chasing group, and there could be a regrouping behind yet. Uh, I don't think Franco would have chosen to make the move this early before the finish, but I think he's found himself left with absolutely no choice. Hand up there is to uh, call up his team manager, Patrick Lefebvre, who before the start this morning said that the two leaders for the MAPE squad were going to be Stefano Zanini and Johan Museo. And now uh, he's going to say something to him like, uh, well, I told you this morning you shouldn't have given it to me. That's uh, Fabrizio Fabri, the other team manager, the Italian team manager there, as he takes on board some uh, high energy drink. And now he's settling down, obviously, for the big escape. And we haven't seen a big escape uh, like this for some years in Perry Bay, not by the single rider. This, this is the quality of the great Eddie Merckx now. And Franco Ballerini has wanted this, even though he has won it once. And he'll always tell you he should have already have won Perry Bay twice, because he actually threw it away in the sprint finish, which was finally taken by Gilbert Duclos Lozal, who did also win it twice. He certainly did. Well, Michael Rick has recovered there after being dropped on the cobblestones and pulled himself back into this race. And these riders, these men who've been out since the uh, 57th kilometre of the race this afternoon, really must be on a high to know that they're still in with a chance at the end of this very difficult Paris-Roubaix. A lot of discussion going on there between Taffy and Wilfred Peters. I wonder what they're thinking about. 
Well, maybe they're going to plot the second and third finishes because it's a possibility now that they could do what we thought you'd never see in a generation again, and that's the one team uh, claim the top three places, which Mappe did a couple of years ago when Museo won, and then it was Bortolami and Andrea Taffy. Bortolami, by the way, is still very much in this race and is coming up in the group behind the Moncasin group. And so he too is still in this race, along with Henk Vogels is in that group as well, and Christoph Capel. And Andre Schmil, we understand, has bridged to the second half of the chase group. We haven't seen him all day. It's not been anywhere near any of the TV cameras, and another man who will have an awful lot to talk about tonight. But Paris Roubaix is about that. If you get a chance to um, uh, act as a fly on the wall in the showers, every rider who finished this event has a story of woe about Paris Roubaix the punctures, the crashes the technical problems and it always is something that these riders are proud of to be able to talk about taking part in Paris-Roubaix and today I do feel Phil that this has been one of the great Paris-Roubaix because these conditions really are atrocious. This has been a superb Paris-Roubaix we thought it would be because of the weather conditions these last two weeks uh, but these are the men who've made it so exciting and Ballerini has been simply superb. It's a shame we couldn't have witnessed his chase across from the back groups because they must have been quite spectacular. He certainly must have been, but for the moment, he's got to try and ride consistently, not push himself too hard now, because what he has to now do now is dose his effort over the next 45 minutes of racing, because there's still a long way to go before we get to the finish. You can see how fast he's riding over these cobblestones. He's able to pick his way very carefully. He's all on his own, and he realizes that he's got two men behind, two very able lieutenants to try and close down any counter-attacks, but he must make sure that he doesn't push himself too hard. Well, he's riding very, very strong at the moment and doesn't appear to be faltering at all. He, he's on a mission and he's proved that to us today. He gets drawn to Roubaix like nobody else seems to be. And he hasn't ridden this race in the front. He's had to come from the back to do it. And when you do that, I just somehow just don't see him failing now. And we certainly wouldn't wish any ill luck on him. As we see another huge sector here with the crowds enormous. They always seem to know where to go because they know where the crashes might happen and they know uh, the particularly vicious stretches of cobblestones. And this, uh, this sector here, well, the water's on the right, but Ballerini's quite happy down the middle. Now, these riders here coming into sector seven. Still is Baxter on the front, Phil. He's doing a magnificent ride this afternoon, the Swedish rider on the GAN squad. All the time we come back to this chasing group, we can see the work done by the Swede, Magnus Baxter. A real revelation and a man who I think Roger Leger is going to be very happy that he signed up to his squad. But interesting to note that Leger has always been fairly interested in signing up foreign riders. He's never been one of the French team managers to stick with the French riders on his squad. He does have some, but he has an awful big group of uh, expatriates riding for him. The Australians, Chris Borman from Great Britain, and now Magnus Bagstead. And the funny thing is, whereas you expect the riders to learn the language of the manager, in the Gann case, the manager has learned to speak English quite well, so he can speak to all the riders he's signed up. He certainly knows uh, how to look after them. I think all that will goes back to the days when he used to manage Greg LeMond and one of the few French managers at the time who actually took time out to try and learn the English language because he realised how important it was going to be with the number of English-speaking riders coming into the sport. Franco Ballerini, by the way, doesn't speak English, only speaks Italian and French. And Patrick Lefebvre, the team manager there behind in the MAPE team car, very fluent in the Italian language, so I would think a lot of communication going between these two men at the moment. Now this group we're looking at now, officially a minute and 42 seconds back, somewhere ahead is Ludo Dirickson because he hasn't been caught to the best of our knowledge and of course the leader on the road now is Franco Ballerini. This is the zigzag corner where we were on the ground when we went around the corner with Ballerini and a minute and 42 seconds has slipped by since he went around this bend. Three, six, uh, eight riders still here in this group. I have no signs of Tom Steele, so I don't think he recovered uh, on that corner. He never got back up to the group. He stayed behind. He might well have been picked up by that Schmill group, which is coming up. But we've got no time checks on that group at all. He must be pretty happy with one minute, 42 seconds advantage over this group. Now, if he can just build it up to around about two minutes, then he can start to dose his effort a lot more sensibly and make sure that he can just maintain his advantage over the chasing group. Interesting, though, Phil, it still backs it on the front here. And it's nice to see that Michael Rick is still tagged onto the back of this group, as is the young French rider Thierry Gouvenou. Well, they both had a great day in Paris Bay today, and... Uh... If they hang on for a bit longer, they're going to get a very high finish here. It could be in the top 15 on the day, and that's nothing to be sniffed at in Paris-Roubaix. 
this is a real tough race today just look at the mud there on the wheels and the cranks of Franco Ballerini who continues at a terrific pace here because it looks to me Paul as though he's actually going quicker uh, than that chase group right now I think he's pulling away he certainly is flying it's nice as well to get a chance to look at the machine that he's using this afternoon basically it's a standard machine there's no bells and whistles nothing fancy nothing modern it's a basic carbon fiber Colnago machine no suspension on the front but a normal bike like Eddie Merckx would have won his Paris-Roubaix on so he will be very happy to see the return of standard machines to an event like Paris-Roubaix the reason that the Colnago team don't use the suspension forks is because Ernesto Colnago the designer of these machines will not have suspension forks or any changes done to his frames he claims that he can build a bicycle which will ride comfortably over the cobblestones and it certainly is this afternoon it certainly is and if you call a glimpse of that uh, speedometer there on the motorbike it said 50 kilometers an hour that's 31 miles an hour he's riding on the, on the flat roads here now there's no way in the world that anybody's going to be catching him if he can hold that sort of speed that's the important thing for him to do now is just to make sure that he, he rides sensibly he'll be getting information from his team manager on a regular basis now because right behind him in the team car Patrick Lefebvre and the Italian team manager Fabrizio Fabri will be conferring they'll be getting information from the race radio all the time coming up here to let him know just exactly what is happening behind Fabrizio Fabri there on the right hand side there obviously consulting the television because a lot of these team managers for the big classics Phil they actually have a television on board so they can see exactly what is going on in the race and they can get a lot more information than they can from race radio you think they have better things to do when they're working to watch television in the car wouldn't you but anyway they're going to be delighted and I would think a little bit surprised at the way this race is turning out for them because uh, 200 kilometers ago they thought the whole race was through the window and now they've got two in the chase group and one in the lead Backstead will not give up, will he? This big Swede is pile driving this breakaway through again. And that's Leon Van Bon behind him, then Moncassan, then Rolf Sorensen. And then there are Wilfred Peters, Taffy, uh, Thierry Gouvenu, and Mik Michael Rick sitting there at the back. Well, those two riders moving to the back a little bit more often than they were before now for them it's just a question of survival they realize now how far it is to go in Paris Bay and all they want to do is make sure that they can stay with this group till it gets to the velodrome in Roubaix because that would be a great performance for them they're looking at a top 10 position and when they went out of the pack at kilometer 57 this morning I don't think either of them thought that they would survive all the way till the end on to zone at number six and as we thought in fact Paul it was 1 minute 42 but now Ballerini's lead is 2 minutes and 20 that's remarkable this is a very dangerous section of cobblestones too you can see how much mud there is on the side of the road it's only a short section of cobblestones but it certainly is one of the tricky ones and Ballerini is absolutely flying across here he slipped his back wheel just a little bit there and he's now back safely onto the smooth pavement a nice easy section and uh, it was only a couple of hundred meters at 300 meters I think and he's now uh, 20 miles from the finish 32 kilometers and that, uh, well, in theory, will take him around 35, 40 minutes to cover at the sort of speed he's riding at. Well, he's now got around about four miles to ride on the good pavement before he comes into the town of Cizouin, and that is where there is a very long section of cobblestones. And once again, when we went to look at it a couple of days ago, it was very muddy indeed. So that could be a point where the race starts to split up behind. Moncassin looks very comfortable, but I don't think he's got the power that his own teammate has got. And in fact, he's just checking there on his heart rate monitor, so he's obviously going through a bit of difficulty. Well, I hope it's good news, because actually this man doesn't look too dirty at all today. He looks like he's had a fairly trouble-free journey over the cobblestones oh he spent an awful lot of time in the front which is more to the truth I think uh, hasn't had to ride behind the back wheels of the riders look at Sorison going through there he's obviously been on the floor Backstead's been okay he's, uh, he's he looks a little bit ungainly on the bike but nonetheless he's certainly got a lot of power coming out of him and up comes the team manager there with a little bit of information Roger Leger talking to Moncassin and what he's telling him now is what we've just told you that the gap has now gone up to 2 minutes and 20 seconds and Roger Leger, oh he's come back, I thought he'd gone straight on there <laughs> I thought he was looking for the shortcut to Roubaix there not happy with the performance of his team but it is a very a very difficult job the team manager has to uh, do on a day like Pay roubaix he has to negotiate not only the cobblestones, give information to the riders but also pay attention to the way the road zigzags across the north of France but Phil look at this, still at the back there 
they're riding side by side, the two Mape riders, Tappy and Peters, talking all of the time, discussing, trying to figure out exactly what the tactics must be going into the closing stages. And I'm pretty sure that they've had such an easy ride on one section of cobbles or another in the future, they're going to put the hammer down and try and split this group. Well, I wonder if you're right. And I don't think they'll want to incite anything from the group until they feel that Ballerini has the desired lead over them which now is 2 minutes 20 seconds as they go on to a zone 6 as well. Ballerini was well through this section now, this was the short section you may recall. And it looks like Van Bon has been left to set the pace here now with Fred on his wheel. Focus Actually, that. sorry Paul, it wasn't very far away from here, I'm not giving too many secrets away. When we're talking of cars, there is Roger Leger, my driver turned us upside down, but he couldn't quite get round one of the corners at all. He was very apologetic though, wasn't he? He was, he said yes. there was um, oil on the road, I think, was his excuse. Yeah, well, there was a camera on my head. <laughs> but we all came through it well, and we got to interview the winner, who on that occasion was Jean-Marie Wampers of, uh, of Belgium. And Wampers, by the way, is Flemish for diapers. And uh, there was a few jokes about that, I seem to recall. <laughs> I'm sure he sucked up a lot of humour with that. But in fact, that was also the same section of cobbles, if you go back to uh, CBS coverage of Paris-Roubaix many years ago. There was a magnificent crash by Theo de Roy going along there yeah. as he fell off in the in a, again a very muddy Paris-Roubaix. It was indeed but uh, the last few Paris-Roubaix have been mostly dust uh, until we got to this great edition today and I think Ballerini if he gets to the end as the winner will go down in the annals of history as one of the great all-time winners of Paris-Roubaix certainly in post-war years because this has been a tremendous show of strength. He's now coming round the back of the town of Tompleuve and at a very short distance he will ride into the town of Cizouin where the section of cobbles is that you can remember in 1994 André Schmiel was almost caught by Johan Museo and then he cracked, had problems with his new pedals, problems with his new dual suspension bike and had to change at the side of the road and André Schmiel rode on to victory that day. But when you get there that section of cobbles is still 26 kilometres to go before the finish line and I'm um, fairly sure that Franco Ballerini he knows that. And if you think Paul Sherwin seems to know these roads remarkably well, well he should because he used to live in the area when he was a cyclist. But I never used to ride over the cobblestones for training. I knew where they all were and I used to do my best to try and avoid them. The only time that uh, I would ride the cobblestones at Paris-Roubaix were actually in the event. And I can't blame you for that though. Also, uh, by the way, if you ever get a chance to enter and ride, if you ever want to ride Paris-Roubaix, not the professional race, they have a randonneur, an Audax event here, where you can have a crack at riding the complete course on a different day, and many, many hundreds of cyclists do take up the opportunity. It's a fun day out, of course, until you have problems and you've got to repair it all by yourself. But then so did these bike riders 60 years ago. They certainly did, and if you want to do that Audax ride, I'd suggest you uh, do it on a mountain bike. It's a lot more comfortable. Good point. Now back to the race here and Franco Ballerini is still pile driving on the latest time check Paul he's now over three minutes up so he's just riding away from the field. Well I never would have thought that a man going out almost 60 kilometers from the finish and building up a lead like this all the time and he doesn't look at all as if he's starting to weaken he's riding at a very good effort he's making sure that he stays well within his limits but there's no pressure being put on him at all and unless there's a major reaction comes from that group behind this man is going to ride into Roubaix on his own because he's riding sensibly he's riding consistently he's picking his way over the cobblestones very nicely indeed and he knows just exactly how far it is to go and I think for the moment there's no pressure at all on the shoulders of Franco Ballerini. 33 years of age, Franco turned professional back in 1986, 12 seasons ago. And he's still winning the best bike races in the world. And I think I'm safe in saying he'll win this, but a three minute buffer is a nice buffer now because it means that he has got room for a puncture or a fall and a remount and still stay up in front. Now, Mon Kassan still doing his share of the work here with some help coming from the muddied Leon van Bon from his fall in the forest of Arenberg. And Baxted, well, he's looking tired now, but he still won't give up working. He won't give up working, but you can't uh, reproach him for looking tired because he has done a monster share of the work this afternoon. He's always gone to the front. He's always been pushing to try and make sure he can bring his team leader, Frédéric Moncassin, back into the race. And here again is a word of advice for Ballerini. But it, at this stage of the race, Paul, the fact he's pulling away, he knows how he feels and he's feeling pretty good inside right now. He knows, he doesn't need to be told that he probably is pulling away from the race. 
He certainly needs to be told, I think, because it, it's always good to have the idea because he's all on his own in the race. Nobody around him, nobody to give him concise information. And the fact that it's going up all the time will, in fact, boost his morale. It'll make him feel an awful lot more comfortable. And when it does start to hurt just a little bit, he'll know that he can back off because he does have that buffer, which is now up around three minutes. Patrick Lefebvre on the phone. I wonder if he's on the phone to Milano talking to Dr. Squincy. Well... There was always the controversy a couple of years ago that the phone call actually arranged the result of Paris-Roubaix when the three Mappé boys were out in front, Museo, Bortolami and uh, Taffy. Well, there's no need to call up to arrange the result today because there's only one. And Franco Ballerini looking pretty cool and comfortable out there now. He's through the town of Cisoin and he's now heading round to the back doubles towards Roubaix. He's a huge rider, a very big man, not at home when it comes to the big mountains of races like the Tour de France and the Tour of Italy, but once you come to these short, flat climbs that they have around Flanders or they have in Paris-Roubaix, he certainly does feel at home. He finished third overall in, Paris in Tour of Flanders last year in what for him could have been a victory when he and Rolf Sorensen came up against Frédéric Moncassin. So certainly this Italian rider very much at home when it comes to these roads of the north of France and lower Belgium. And I think just in the corner there, there is Ludo Dirksen, so he's about to get picked up by this chasing group of eight. You're absolutely right, there he is. So Dirksen, who has been out in front since Saint-Quentin, is now seeing the race for second place at the moment come by him, led by Moncassin. They know now there's only one man ahead as well. Now, Dirksen looking for a back wheel, or is he going to go straight through and out the back door? tap on the head they're coming from Andrea Taffy is it in fact it was Wilfred Peters the Belgian yeah. rider he uh, yeah. knows this man very well and I think he's just saying uh, well done great ride today but we're here try and stay with us for the ride because it could be fun I think you're right there but it was nice to see that uh, manoeuvre by Wilfred Peters he appreciates uh, a fellow professional's work today as uh, again all the work being done by the GAN teams with a little help from Van Bon and Rolf Sorensen now this is the town of Cizouin and that is the next section of cobblestones that Franco Ballerini will be facing just in the top there you can see the trees and this is a very tricky section of cobblestones not the same as it used to be a couple of years ago because in fact it's split into two there is some tarmac in the middle and Franco Ballerini will know it very well all of the riders really do have an intimate knowledge of Paris-Roubaix because the ones who come here year after year are the ones who really want to ride this event you can't force a rider to take part in Paris-Roubaix because it takes a very special mentality to want to come and race it well Bernard Eno is famous for criticizing this event and he said he rode it once to win it so he could say he'd never ride it again it was inhuman and now he's part of the organising committee, so I'm not sure where he stands anymore. But we're now on the last five, or well, the fifth of five stretches remaining now of the cobblestones as we head now towards the finish. And three minutes, ten seconds, so he's still nosing clear. It's still amazing to see this man pulling away from the chasing group behind because that chasing group now is up to nine riders strong. But he has the advantage of being able to pick his way through the cobblestones and nobody's going to pull any time back on, on him on the cobblestone sections because you cannot work together on these sections. It's a question of one man riding at the front and setting the pace for the whole group. So that is where the advantage is for Franco Ballerini. It's one man chasing one man. But up the road he still has some very serious sections of cobblestones that he has to come up to. And the one I think is the hardest is the one that's known as the Pavé Bleu, which then turns into the Pavé de l'Arbre, which is a very difficult, long section where the race is very often decided. Well that is a particularly nasty section that they're on right now I don't know if you noticed the wheel spin of Ballerini there and I certainly take my hat off to our cameramen here who have to stay up with the leaders in Paris-Roubaix skilled motorbike handlers they are and you might note too that they were the Paris-Roubaix uniform our cameraman oh he's looking at us now because uh, they are so proud of this event there is a status a symbol of getting that uniform on because these cameramen are pretty special people and they're staying with Ballerini now who is continuing to pull away from the rest of the field and just look at these cobblestones they really are atrocious but he's riding over them with so much confidence the advantage when you are in good shape and you have the strength is that you can still control your machine once you start to fatigue and get a little bit of tiredness into the upper part of your body then you don't have the agility re left required that you can actually move the back end of the bicycle and control it when it starts to slip and for the moment everything is going right for Franco Ballerini you can see here there's no movement in the upper part of his body looking very strong indeed as he just floats onto the, the new pavement again chance for him to recover before the next section end of zone five just four sections remaining now time is running out for the race behind and I don't think it matters an iota now there they are they are just about onto zone number five 
and so the gap is 3 minutes and 15 seconds over the leader who continues to pull away and if you analyze this breakaway really there's only four riders doing any work the back four here are just watching and having a bit of a hard time there was Thierry Gouverneur the big Mac rider on the back and that's right there's only four riders who are prepared to chase at all in this group the two men from Rabobank and the two riders from Gann and I would think that shortly is going to be down to three men because the work that Magnus Baxter has done must mean that surely he can't have all that much energy left in his legs and there he is in fourth place, concentrating, trying to relax a little bit, but it's not easy. As Rolf Sorensen pulls a pretty face at the front of this race, bouncing through the cobbles and over the mud. Now the riders letting the gaps form between the wheels. They start to plot their own course to this very tricky section. Back up at the front here, Ballerini. You can tell by this man's face that it is all happening for him today, and this is going to be a marvellous performance. In fact, when he, when he was beaten by Gilbert Duclos-Lassalle, he was riding Paris-Roubaix like this. He was so strong, so confident, but he had the Frenchman all of the time sitting on his wheel. He had exactly the same power as he has today. His advantage this afternoon, though, is there's nobody behind him except around about three and a half minutes down the road. Yes, and I think he, he probably, as you say, Paul, it went through his mind about Duclos when uh, he had Didikson on his wheel, and that's why he decided to rid himself of, of the Belgian. He wasn't going to take or make that mistake twice. Now the chase group, by the way, they seem to be spread now. It's over nearly five minutes now back to the third group on the road and three and a half minutes back to that chase group. So he's pulling away from everybody and surprisingly, it's a big chase group. They're not catching up with the group being led by Sorensen. This race really now is becoming a question of survival at the front. Looks like... That's Leo certainly Van survival Bond. on that bend. They're ever so frightened of that corner. Well, it's a bit tricky, a little precarious as you turn right after these, uh, this, the two sections of cobblestones outside Cizouin as they move around the corner there. That was Van Bond taking them round and a very tricky section. And I think you're right, you can almost see the difference in the speed. Ballerini was flying over these cobblestones and now I think this group really is just trying to survive and make sure that they don't have too many incidents. Well, they certainly seem to me to be losing the impetus here. I think the fact it's Franco Ballini, all these riders know him. They're, they know his reputation in Paris Bay, and there might be a psychological problem here. They may well feel that this man can't be stopped today right now. End of zone number five for them too. The only thing they can hope for now that he cracks, he has some kind of glucose exhaustion, he forgets to eat because of the excitement of being at the front of a race like this. But the thing with Franco Ballerini, he's too experienced a professional. He's been professional since 1986. He knows how to react under conditions like this and he knows that he has to keep eating, he has to keep drinking to keep his energy levels topped up to the maximum. He's also in a great situation, riding well within himself because now as he's oh, riding fairly sensibly, his lead is still increasing. Well, as we watch the legs of Ballerini, here is a little bit of information which I've just worked out, Paul. He rides number 12 in the race. The date today is the 12th of April. Last night he stayed in room 12 in the hotel. He attacked on Parve number 12, and it's his 12th season of racing. Now, are you superstitious? I hope he doesn't finish 12th. Well, that's a good point, but I think there's no danger of that right now. <laughs> That's a very good statistic there, and I think uh, Franco Ballerini probably is very happy that he doesn't have number 13. Number 13, in fact, is worn by his own teammate, Bart Lazen. And so far, as far as we know, he has, he has punctured, in fact, Ballerini. We didn't see it. It was very early on. Uh, but he looks as though he's not having any problems at all. He's got the right tyres on today for the conditions. He's now on a nice, smooth stretch road. He's crossing towards Pave number four. And so he's got about a three-mile gap between the two. Uh, that was when he came off Pave number five, but it's a lot closer now. It certainly is the group behind now. You can see organising themselves, but still only three or four riders working at the front. Michael Rick tagged on the back there, very happy to be there. And I would think really surviving to stay in contact with that group because those riders have had a long day at the head of affairs. Well, it must feel like now he's on a wide open freeway here after all the narrow roads of the cobbles and probably quite pleased to be here as well. Chance of settling again to around about that 30 mile an hour time trialing mode of his. He looks so solid today, Ballerini, as springtime comes to this part of northern France. A little bit behind because of the cold snap that they've had. 
And it's the left hand turn onto the next section of Cobblesville. I remember that from this little farm on the right hand side there. Every bike rider in the north of France knows that farm because they know you come along a big long section of road and then you turn left. And this in fact is a pretty sticky section of cobblestones too. It climbs up, it doesn't look like it here, but it really is a hard section of cobblestones. You climb up here to the top, turn right, and you've still got an awful long way before you get back onto nice smooth roads again. And I think we went past the banner that said 20 kilometers to go, so about 12 miles to battle to the finish now. And I wonder what's going through Ballerini's mind uh, right at this moment, because when he jumped away, he can't really have believed he could ride to the finish all on his own. But as it closer they get to the finish, he must be getting a lot more confident, especially now that the gap is now approaching the four minute mark. He's uh, nudging one of the biggest margins, I think, uh, for many years. Well, he had no choice at the end of the day. He had to go because that group was coming up behind. And by the same token, you know, even though he's on the same team as Taffy and uh, Wilfred Peters, I think he'd be almost afraid of them as well. And because there are two more riders who want to win Paris Bay, and this man is possessed by this event, and he wanted to make sure it was his today. And I think it will be now. Certainly riding with a little bit of anger, I think, too, in his legs that uh, Patrick Lefebvre didn't give him full confidence at the start this morning, putting confidence in the Mape squad, mainly in Stefano Zanini, the leader of the World Cup, and Johan Museo. And so I think uh, for him it's also uh, sorting out the accounts of the team as well to say, look, when I say I'm good for Paris-Roubaix, I mean it. Yes, and I don't think, uh, well, Museo's now out and gone to hospital, but Museo would never come clean and say he would help uh, Ballerini at all, which left a big question mark over who would have won this race if Museo was still in it. Now, a little bit of ballet dancing here on this bend, because the cobblestones have almost disappeared beneath a cake of mud. But he gets round it nicely, the crowd enjoying the spectacle, and he's OK, he's onto dry road again, he's up and running. Uh, the news on Museo, by the way, is he's got a, quite a nasty cut on his knee and uh, he's had a number of stitches in it, but he is still in hospital. Well, that's a sad, uh, sad day for Johan Museo because uh, that bad knee is going to put him out for quite a few, uh, few weeks to come. And that is a shame because the form that he had last week, I actually thought he could win Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix because he just rode away from everybody last week in the Tour of Flanders. And the form that he had from the week before when he won those two races in Belgium certainly showed that it was the big Johan Museo of old. Absolutely right. Recovered from... Uh when he was the world champion and he only won a few smaller races and he had bad luck in all of the big races. Well, this rider's got no thoughts of whatever happened to Museo today. Now he's thinking of what might happen to him if he can claim a second cobblestone trophy to take back home to Italy. And he's knocking off all the pave and he's riding them like they are smooth road. He's just dancing over the top today. Certainly no signs of weakness in Franco Ballerini going over these cobblestones. You can see how relaxed the front part of his body is. What he does here is, in fact, he doesn't hold the handlebars very tightly and tries to steer the machine. He allows the machine to go where it wants to go. And his hands are really there just for the final control. That is why he is such a great rider when it comes to going over these cobblestones. The speed is high, the suppleness is there, he isn't tired at all, and he lets his bike go where it wants to. Now, these boys are approaching that nasty stretch of cobbles, and it'll be interesting to see how they get round that right-hand bend. It certainly will, but I think that may be the section of cobbles where the uh, riders have been at the head of the race for an awful long time may well be put into difficulty, because it's a long section of cobbles, and as you saw before, when Franco Ballerini went along there, it is slightly uphill. And that may be why Andrea Taffy's come to the front now, because he wants to get rid of one or two of these passengers. Well, past the farm that Paul mentioned earlier, and now this nasty stretch of cobblestones, an ideal place for strong men to have a go. Michael Rick doesn't look too strong sitting at the back now, and in fact, Dirickson has also slipped away here under the impetus of Taffy. Taffy is a vastly underrated bike rider. He really can produce some terrific races. He certainly can. He won his first uh, professional time trial victory this year in the Tour de Langkawi, and he held the lead in that event in Malaysia until the penultimate day when his own teammate Gabriel Misaglia took him off him in a very dramatic climb up to a place called the Genting Highlands. Well, maybe word has reached Taffy that he's free to do a little bit of work now to make this group much smaller because the gap is almost four minutes now to Franco Ballerini, nobody else in front. And so Taffy now might want to sort of reduce this group and strengthen his own chances and that of Wilfred Peters of a higher finish at Roubaix. The last three sections of the Pave today for Franco. Well, this is the section I was telling you about before called the Pave Bleu. They really are a very difficult section of cobblestones. They call them the Pave Bleu because that means blue cobblestones. They're a very hard granite 
and in situations like this they are very slippy indeed he's picking himself across them very easily and once he gets around uh, a couple more corners he goes onto the section then known as the pave de l'arbre where in years gone by a lot of riders have launched themselves to success and he will realize that when he comes to the end of this section he has 17 kilometers left to go to the finish I think this is the stretch uh, a few years ago when Jonathan Bowyer uh, launched himself into the field. He made a spectacular crash and uh, that videotape was replayed many times. And Jonathan now retired, of course, and Franco Ballerini, well, I suppose he's not too far away from retirement himself. Uh, but he's going to go out now with uh, certainly two wins in Paris Bay under his belt. He's flicking across there to get onto the uh, path at the side of the cobblestones. Ballerini still looking very comfortable still looking very confident and confident as he picks his way across these cobblestones but you can see all of the dampness that has come onto the course a lot of that from the mountain bike race yesterday and the cars and the press vehicles that have gone ahead of today's Paris Roubaix but Ballerini safely through there once he gets to the end of the section here he take a left hand turn and then he'll climb up to the, co the little cafe of the uh, the Arbre 17 kilometers if that left to go now for Franco Ballerini Cobblestones as bad as ever. There's the gendarmerie guiding the riders through the sections of cobblestones. Certain areas banned to all followers except team vehicles, so not even the press or the television can get down these roads because of the fear that should they have an accident or break down, the race itself would be blocked. And the way clear now for Franco Ballerini. His face giving nothing away here as he bounces over these cobblestones. Remember, he's broken away with something like 25 miles to go on his own. He's dodging this one a little bit, Paul. He's having to hold his bike up because the ground now is absolutely atrocious as Ballerini heads towards the end of zone number three, which will leave him just 17 kilometers to go. And I don't blame you, Franco. Take it easy. Certainly, what he was trying to do there was stay on the crest of the cobblestones because it was just a little bit drier than the cobbles on either side of it. But the problem is, to do that, you have to take one or two little risks. And because of the camber, you can get uh, loss of traction in the front and the rear of the machine. So Ballerini there, precariously picking himself over the top of the cobblestones. You can just see the little crown there, which is where Ballerini is riding now. Well, he flashes by. The lead car looks close, but in fact it's an optical illusion. He's not that close to the to the leader here. Ballerini hasn't put a wheel wrong on this course today. Not that we know of, anyway. He's riding with such confidence. They've dried out a little bit to uh, the cobblestones just here. The crowd enjoying the spectacle as they lean forward to see Ballerini. Remember, they've listened to this on radio or watched it on television before they've come into view so they know who's coming at them and Ballerini, although he's Italian, is a very popular personage here. He certainly is. Any rider who performs well consistently in Paris-Roubaix and the Tour of Flanders endears himself not only to the French from the north of France but also to the Belgians. The flags will be out from all the countries of Europe over the next few kilometres waving for Franco Ballerini and you know what Phil, it looks as if he's getting stronger as the race is going on. Time checks are still increasing, he's nibbling up now to nearly four and a half minutes at the moment and this is a long stretch of cobbles here, just over two kilometres in fact. So even at the end of the race, Roubaix will not lie down. But Ballerini just seems to be getting quicker and quicker. The Belgian flag flying, won't worry Franco, he's seen plenty of Italian flags amongst this crowd as well. He certainly has, this is the end of the Pave de l'Arbre as he makes the right hand turn. Not a very uh, short rest for him on the smooth pavement before he turns left onto the next section of cobblestones, but a long flat section here, and then he'll be heading down towards Gruzon, and they'll be feeling a lot more confident now because he's well inside, 20 minutes to go to the finish. He knows now that it's not much longer, and he'll also be relishing very shortly the thought of entering a stadium packed with enthusiasts, a totally free spectacle, nobody's charged to go into the Roubaix Stadium, and it is packed out with people. They're watching it from the centre on a huge screen, and they're cheering every move already. It's a real atmosphere in the stadium. He's pretty confident, Phil, the way he went round that corner there. He hardly slowed down at all. He leaned into the corner as if it was a dry section of cobblestones, kept his speed high, and now on the drier section, he's using all of his power to pick his pace up again to around about 45, 46 kilometres an hour. Ballerini, very confident indeed the way he's riding over these cobblestones, and still there's no signs of weakness in his shoulders at all getting stronger as the day goes on. Really going to be a great win for this man because barring a break of his machinery, I don't think that anything is going to stop him riding alone to the victory in Paris-Roubaix. 
Well, this time on, a kilometre of cobbles, rather a cruel little section, this. they all call it Zone 3. In, in total, it is 3.3 kilometres long. Taffy at the front here, still trying to cause a little bit of damage in that group behind, but shadowing him, Frederic Montcassin, and right behind there, moving up, is uh, Wilfred Peters. And this looks like crunch time for this group here, because, in fact, those three have got themselves a gap. Van Bon and Sorensen, Sorensen at the front at the moment, Van Bon at the back of these three. A backstead surely is just about on his limits now. Moncassan has tried to get in touch with the two Mappe boys, but there could be big trouble for Fred here because he's got both of them. In fact, as I speak, this looks like an attack from Wilfred Peters going. Peters, in fact, just trying to stay in contact right. there with yeah. the pressure on the front here by Andrea Taffy. Moncassan taking a lot of risks there, going right through the gutter, splicking across now to the wheel of Wilfred Peters. Peters has decided that he's going to take up the pressure and try and crack Frederic Mocassin. A little bit of touch of shoulders there. There's no love lost between these boys. They've been sitting on for the last 30 or 40 kilometres, but that is their right. Their man, Franco Ballerini, is leading the race. And it certainly does look as if this rear group has cracked. Well, they got round that corner. Moncassin wrestling his bike a little bit, but he's a fair good mountain bike rider, is Fred Moncassin, as well and so he's a good bike handler. But right now he's got his hands completely full here with the two Mappe boys because they've both got in front of him now and it looked in that flash of the camera there that they're beginning to get rid of Fred Moncassin here. This is a serious move to give Mappe one, two, three. Well, they're going for it now. Look at Wilfred Peters. He's really got the hammer down. Almost on his wheel is Andrea Taffin. They've got the gap that they were looking for. They knew the danger man was Frederic Moncassin. They had to get rid of him before the finish if they were going to try and repeat their success of a couple of years ago. That's finishing first, second and third. But now they've still got 17 kilometres to go for the finish. So if I was Fred, I'd sit up now and wait for the Rabobank boys behind. I think he's no choice, Paul, because they're catching him and the two boys up front well, I'm really not a betting man, but had I been, I would have said you would have never have seen Mappe take one, two, three in a Paris Bay again in lifetime. They did it in 1994, when incidentally Ballerini was fifth on that occasion, almost giving them a top four finish. But now he's on the, in the lead, and Peters and Taffy are going away from what is a very tired chase group, and there's no one else near these riders at all now, because the next group on the road is some two and a quarter minutes behind. Well, Taffy taking a lot of risks down the side there to get onto the smoothest part of the road to try and pick up just a little bit of extra speed. But once he started to slow down, Wilfred Peters comes over to help him out and try and build up an advantage over the rest of that group. They've laid now already round about 10 seconds over the group with Frederic Moncassin. Well, Fred, I think, found his hands full there. He didn't know what to do. He tried to hang on, but they, they really did work him over and he lost his wheel a little bit. They chose the bad section of cobble. This, of course, is the advantage of going and taking a good look at the course. And if you're in a position to win this race, you know when you can put home the vital attack. They're now on to the second segment of zone number three. This is a kilometre long. Certainly is a very long, hard section of cobblestones. But when Mappé finished first, second and third a couple of years ago, they got an awful lot of criticism in the press, especially from Jean-Marie Leblanc, the organiser of the Tour de France and, of course, Paris-Roubaix, by saying that they manipulated the result of one of the great classics. Well, the way this race has played itself out today, even if they do finish first, second and third, I don't think anybody can criticise the way they've ridden. That's absolutely true. And this man has deserved his victory today. He'll have a great story to tell the press at the end of it. And he won't uh, be blaming Johan Museo for anything like foul tactics and not helping him win the race because poor old Johan is currently in hospital with his crash. He's been taken uh, to a small hospital just across the border in Kortrek where in fact uh, information coming to us that he's actually broken his kneecap and uh, that will put him out for an awful long time, especially at such a late age in his career. So that is a shame because Museo had fantastic form, but these two riders now certainly got a, a fight on their hands because that group behind, once they get onto the smoother sections of roads, will organize themselves and try and pull back the two Mappe riders. But you have to not forget, Phil, that these two men have been sitting at the back of that group for an awful long time now. Well, if you can have fresh legs at around about 260 kilometers covered, then these guys have got them but they've left behind some very tired bike riders and it's amazing how this race has swung round in the favour of Mappe when really by midway through it looked a total disaster for them. 
It certainly did. Patrick Lefebvre was almost devastated by the fact that he'd lost the two men who he counted on to be the best performers in today's Paris-Roubaix when Stefano Zanini and Johan Museo went down in the forest of Arenberg. But that's what this race is all about. The tide can turn, luck can change, and that's exactly what has happened here to the Mappé team because everything looked to be going wrong and now the ball has changed, the, foot, the, the shoe is on the other foot and they're riding on the crest of a wave. And this man here knows, because he knows this course as well as just about anybody from Belgium or France, that he is now running down towards the last couple of segments of Pave, and then the running into town. it will be that nice ride down to Rube Stadium, and then into an enormous ovation, I would imagine, here at the finishing line. The next two sections of cobblestones are not really a whole lot to write home about either because the penultimate section near Hem has got a long piece of tarmac set road down the side of it so you do get a chance to actually get off the cobblestones and not have uh, too much of a jarring. And then the final section really just before the stadium is very much a section of cobblestones which was put down really as a memento to Paris-Roubaix and it's just outside the stadium itself. And the trees still waiting to blossom out fully as uh, spring takes a while in coming to this corner of France. Nice stretch of smooth road now, and this is where Ballerini all of the time is making ground, but the two chasers are also getting clear of the rest of the race as well, so it really is now possible. Look at the long space now between these two. Once clear, uh, Taffy and Peters have combined into team time trial mode here. Well, that's the great thing about getting away with a teammate towards the end of a race like this because if these two men were on separate teams there would be a little bit of reticence to work full out because you would always be thinking about the other man saving a little bit but at the moment these two riders they know that they've got Franco Ballerini at the head of affairs and they will give 110% because it doesn't matter which one of them finishes second or which one finishes third it is a team effort and they will do everything they can to hold off the group which was behind starting to come back together a little bit the two riders from Gann and Rabobank doing most of the work at the front but nobody is doing anything at all to pull into the advantage that Franco Ballerini has over the field. Well Ballerini is 10 kilometers from the finish now and the chases are just on 12 so there's almost a two kilometer gap between them and that should do it but as you say Paul Taffy himself was not happy when told he was third finisher in the Map A team a couple of years back in that 1-2-3 and uh, so I think now that the decision will be those two riders should they come to the stadium together is uh, may the best man get second. Another man not happy with that 1-2-3 uh, of Mappi was Gianluca Bortolami. In fact, he left the team at the end of the year and went to ride for the Festina squad. And uh, it certainly was a lot of discussions about whether they should have been forced to sprint it out. But at the end of the day, if they had raced straight, I still think Johan Museo would have come out the winner. I would agree. Museo is a brilliant classic rider. And this man is going to be on the par with him now. His first big result came in Paris Bay, really, when he finished fifth in 1991. And since then, he's had a second in 1993, a third in 1994, he won it in 1995, he was fifth in 1996, and now he looks to be back on the winning trail again. Well, this is the penultimate sections of cobblestones just outside the town of Hem and you can see he's keeping away from them as much as he can. I think he's had his fill of cobbles this afternoon and this in fact is the section of cobblestones where Henny Kuiper nearly lost Paris-Roubaix when he won it. And in fact uh, because when he came to the section uh, just at the end of the section here he was flicking across from left to right as all of these riders do to keep on the smooth pavement and he just clipped the cobblestone line there as you can see it, and he ripped his back tyre off and in fact the tyre got stuck between the frame and the gears and he was absolutely panicked stricken so was the mechanic because the group was only about 20 seconds behind but fortunately for Henny on that day they managed to get him a new bike and they managed to get him up and running again and he went on to win that uh, Paris-Roubaix. Henny Kuiper, a man who won a lot of good bike races, never quite won the Tour de France but uh, two second places and he was the world champion and he also won an Olympic gold medal in Munich certainly a very long and illustrious career and uh, if he didn't win too many of the classics the four that he did win were certainly the best ones absolutely now Taffy's won a classic in his life he's won a couple actually as he sits on the back wheel of Wilfred Peters who is one of the strong men of the Map A team and rarely gets the result at the end because he works so hard for his squad well today he's either going to finish second or third in Paris-Roubaix because the group behind is losing ground they are now 25 seconds behind 
And I would have to say, talking about uh, Wilfred Peters, a lot of people said that Sean Yates was one of the most desired domestiques on the circuit when he was racing. I would think now the man that everybody would like to have in their squad is Wilfred Peters because that man is certainly worth two bike riders because he's so powerful and so dedicated to the team that he hardly ever thinks about his own performance. Yes, I couldn't agree more on that score. Around one of the big roundabouts here now. The area, of course, totally closed down for the arrival of Paris Bay, an event which uh, continues to get higher and higher in the public's imagination. First was held back in 1896 when Joseph Fischer of Germany was the winner. In those days, by the way, they used to have bicycle riders as pacemakers. They used to pace the riders and then drop out, and fresh ones would pick up the pacemaking. That's exactly what Andrea Taffy's doing here to Wilfred Peters. Taffy on the front there with the the uh, blue knee warmers keeping himself uh, warm up against the cold that the riders have had to encounter throughout this afternoon and the, you know they're not actually opening up quite a big gap over the chasing no. group behind it's hovering around about the 20 seconds so despite the fact that they've been sitting on that group for most of the afternoon there's still a big reaction coming from behind that's right they are not pulling away now they've got the gap for sure but they are not pulling away and if you remember last year uh, the breakaway that was swept up just out of sight of the cameras as they swung into the stadium and that's likely to happen again wow and that was nearly down on the ground then for the rider in the front which was taffy it's peters wasn't it at the front it was, certainly was peters these two riders very much resemble each other and the speed that they're going over these cobblestones at the moment it's a question of you go to the front and i go to the front everybody sharing the work they realize because they can probably hear the crowd a little bit further back cheering on this group which has uh, the best placed frenchman in it frederic moncassin there in fourth position so they know that they haven't opened up the gap that they wanted to and if they don't give everything at the moment as you said it could all come back together right at the entrance to the uh, stadium well Fred has lost the shot of what he always wants and that was a top three finish in Paris Bay and at the moment it's gone from him he won't be happy with anything less and uh, despite the teamwork by his uh, his young mate uh, Backstead well it's four kilometers to go now for Franco Ballerini and the son ironically is coming out to welcome this man into the stadium He's now looking for the first time a little bit tired, but he must know that there's nobody going to catch him. A very tough part of the course here. You think it's flat in the north of France here, but this little climb just outside of Hem is where many riders have launched themselves on their way to victory in Paris-Roubaix, and it is a real sting in the tail. This, in fact, is where Jan Raas blew everybody away when he went to win his Paris-Roubaix, and the last man able to stay with him was Stefan Mutter, and he just kept attacking and attacking till he eventually cracked him. But today, that is not the case for Franco Ballerini. All he has to do is just get to the summit of this climb, and then it's a real coast down to the finish line and a great crowd waiting for him here in the velodrome. Paul's memory going back there to 1982 with Jan Ross, who eventually beat Yvonne Bertin in the stadium. And Jan Ross now the manager, or the senior manager indeed, of the Rabobank team. He doesn't take too much of a part in the team cars these days, but he's pulled the, together a superb sponsorship, uh, not just for pro bike riders, but it goes right down to school kids. Anyway, these two riders now still hovering around about four and a quarter minutes behind their team leader on the road, Ballerini, but only about 20, 25 seconds ahead of this group here, which is the Gans and Rabobanks versus the Mape. Well, it's an amazing race, Phil, because really, if you think about it, over the last hour of this afternoon's race, only three teams have got any publicity at all out of Paris-Roubaix. It's been Gann, Rabobank and Mappé. They're the only people we've seen. Franco Ballerini looking a lot more comfortable now, getting himself dressed up for what's going to be a magnificent reception for him as he cruises down off the top of that uh, climb just outside Hem, and he's now in the suburbs of Roubaix. All of a sudden he feels confident, I think, zipping up his racing top, getting ready for the approach to the stadium. A super crowd here in him. And very shortly they'll be down. A last small section of cobbles, almost symbolic, about a 100 metres of it, in fact, 300 metres of it, just before the finish. And then he'll be on his way into town. There's a picture of Dirk de Mol marking the final roundabout before we get into the uh, stadium of uh, Roubaix. The mall uh, from just over the road here in uh, Kurne. A great, uh, a great win for him in that year's Paris-Roubaix, but it didn't actually finish here. It finished a few miles away at the offices of Laradoute, the great mail-order catalogue that sponsored one of the great teams of the 1980s, which uh, 
I happen to ride for. That's right, called La Redoute, I believe. In 1988 was Dirk de Mol's win, and the prize money then was round about $25,000, and uh, pretty similar to what it is today, actually, though it's probably worth a bit more in those days. Anyway, now we're coming towards what will be the kilometre kite very shortly for Franco Ballerini. He will flick off this side of the road. Yes, indeed, he says, and he has deserved this richly today. He'll shortly go into the central reservation and make uh, the last stretch of cobblestones down the middle of the road, and then he'll turn into the stadium, and boy, he'll feel good. It's almost a smile on his face now. He's been away for about an hour and a half. Quite remarkable. I never thought that a man would try and get away from the rest of the field 60 kilometers from the finish of a race like Paris-Roubaix but he obviously knew himself he knew he was in a great day and besides he's riding for the number one team in the world and knew he would get an awful lot of help from his teammates behind so Franco Ballerini now on final approach here heading into what they call the Espace Croupland which is the central reservation that they open up just for the arrival of Paris-Roubaix and where they have laid cobblestones for the riders to race over. There's the switch coming up now. He'll go under that little archway. He knows now nobody is going to touch him. Here we go. And there's the cobblestones. Just to remind you that this is Paris-Roubaix approaching its climax yet again. And Franco Ballerini continuing his tremendous list of finishes here in this great race. Nobody can say that the cobblestones are too far from the finish to affect the event because they're uh, just around about 200 metres away here from turning into the stadium. Every bike rider knows this finish here. You swing right into the entrance of the stadium, another turn to the left and one more right-hand turn and you're actually on the velodrome. And wait for the roar because the crowd can see him coming in on the big screen. He's already waving to the handful outside the gates. But inside it's a full house because it's a free spectacle, Paris-Roubaix. And look at this now, Ballerini left himself all the time in the world. The man that came from the back to the front and then left himself with no challengers in the 1998 Paris-Roubaix. And this is going to be a huge winning margin indeed. And the time will prove it, but I think we're going to go back to the Holstein days of Eddie Merckx when anybody has come in with a lead like this. The crowd are cheering him all the way. One lap to go for Franco Ballerini. No Gilbert Duclos Lazal to take the prize off him this time. He's going to win it clear on his own and it looks like Paul it's going to be a 1-2-3 as well. Well it certainly will I think if those two riders behind don't ease up over the last few kilometres they should survive the onslaught of the chasing group but Franco Ballerini has certainly put in one of the most magnificent performances in Paris-Roubaix over the last few years to go out 60 kilometres from the finish alone pick yourself back up from being so far behind in the forest of Arenberg that really is a magnificent race. It was a gamble of which I don't think he had any choice at all. He was so strong when he got there, he had to push it home, and he's done it now brilliantly. Coming round the stadium and doesn't have to worry about a sprint. He looks across to see if anybody else is entering the track, but they're a lap and a half behind anyway, if they are. Franco Ballerini gets what I rate as the best win of his career today in Paris-Roubaix. He's going to freewheel right around the back, whereby tradition his helpers will be waiting. Back out on the course though, the race now for second and third. Mappe are going to do a one, two, three for the second time. They did it before in 1996 and only one rider is in that same three up sprint and that's Andrea Taffy. On that occasion he finished third, he was told by the team direction that that was the order they were going to go across the finish line. Johan Museo, Bortolami and Andrea Taffy, but now he's a lot more confident and in fact it looks as if he's starting to play a little bit of a tactical game here because he's forcing Wilfred Peters to make the final few kilometres ride to the section of cobblestones that Franco Ballerini went over just a few moments ago. But it really is a love-hate relationship that Franco Ballerini has had with Paris-Roubaix over these last few years. And you know, rumour has it that in his uh, house he has a huge picture of Paris-Roubaix and he looks at it every day and all he thinks about is coming here for that one day in April. Well, he's going to sleep good tonight because he's going to have uh, bookends on his sideboard back home now of two cobblestones having won this race twice. Now, these two boys, I'm sure, are going to sprint it out because they've worked so well together. Uh, there's no team orders. Uh, the best man can get second and the other one will have to take third. And Taffy, for my bet, is not going to be happy with third, but Peters is a strong finisher. 
He certainly is. He's actually won a couple of races in the sprint in the past in his career, but at the moment he's just burying himself. I think he keeps looking over his shoulder because that chasing group with Frederick Moncassin can't be too far behind. In that the fact, they've looked back several times now, so if they're not careful, they've got to make sure that they keep the speed high because they can still close it down because they've got a lap of this track to do once they cross over the finish line, and that is still quite a long way to go before they reach the finish line. Well, they come into the stadium here. They'll flick right onto the track itself. The showers, by the way, are just on the left there when they finished. And now the riders onto the track and another enormous cheer from the crowd. As the now, what are we going to be treated to here now? Peters or Taffy? Track riders, they are not, but they know all about track finishes in Paris-Roubaix. Uh, Peters is leading Taffy around, which says to me that Taffy is preparing for something special with one lap to go. Certainly is, and they both look very happy. They're not too worried about second and third place. They know that Mappé has been the dominant team here this afternoon. Wilfred Peters still on the front, riding like a Trojan. He finished uh, first in Game Wavel game a couple of years ago, but I think today his performance in Paris-Roubaix will be one that he'll talk about for many years to come. Still, Wilfred Peters on the front, Andrea Taffy in second place, and the other group is coming onto the track right now. And the gap already is four minutes as they start to wind up down the back straight now. Is Taffy going to have a go with Wilfred Peters or is he going to leave it and just finish third again? There's the chase group. They're on the track as well now. Two Gans versus two Rabobanks. And Backstead leading them out there. But Peters has sort of waved by Taffy. He said to Taffy, I think he's agreed he gets second actually because he got third last time. Taffy is second. Wilfred Peters is third. The Mappe, one, two, three for the second time in just a couple of years. Well, they certainly came to this race with a mission. It could well have been first five here as they come up to the line. It's going to be a very close sprint. Moncassan is leading them out. He's not going to be happy at having to sprint for fourth place, but at least he'll want fourth place. But he's going to be challenged on the line, and Leon Van Bon takes it away from him. Van Bon, Moncassan, Sorensen is the order over the line. And the very, very brave Magnus Backstead comes in as well. And the gap is four minutes and 50 seconds. So that's a big winning gap for Ballerini. Well, Leon Van Bon, a medalist in the World Championships with his sprint last year, proving to be quite a developing bike rider now. Certainly is, but look at the joy here. Andrea Taffer, they haven't started the sprint yet for second place. And still, Jean-Luc Bortolami coming up here. A lot of points still at stake. Well, Bortolami here now sprinting it out, and it looks as though he's going to be pipped right on the line. He is indeed by, I think it was Bart Lazen. Another Mappe boy in, and Hank Vogels in that sprint as well. So Vogels also got another great result out of this because uh, he really does like this event. He'll be a little sad to find out what happened to his two teammates, but they're right up there. So it looks as though Paul's showing. He's now down in the track centre. See if we can find him. Well, it looks as though Hank Vogels is not happy with something. He's crossed the line in 10th place, uh, which I think is a great performance, but it's not satisfied Vogels today. So let's see if Paul Sherwin can find out exactly what was going on down there, because this young man is looking very, very frustrated. It's been a tough, tough day today. It is an event which he really likes, uh, but 10th place on this occasion is not good enough. Hey, another tough day for uh, the Gant team. And again, the Mappe were the strongest with Ballerini going going away in the final. Well, I saw Ballerini when I was still with him in the group and he looked awesome. And uh, so did Fred, but we had big Magnus Baxter there. I thought maybe, but oh, it's a pity to see Fred get beaten and uh, the best man won, obviously, in Ballerini. I, I didn't have such a good day, but to finish in the first 10, I'm happy. Three GAN riders in the first 10, uh, I think that's an effort to be com commended. But uh, congratulations, Ballerini. And, well, three in the first 10, it won't be a party tonight, but I'm sure I'm sure it's a great great day for GAN anyway. A really tough Paris-Roubaix today, though. The first time you've ridden it in these kind of conditions, uh, how did it feel? It sucked. It was really bad. I had back wheel slide, front wheel slide. Tristan Hoffman brought me down with 40k to go and I finished, fell on my face, uh, took me 10 kilometres to get back, when I got back I was knackered, but uh, not to take away from the first six guys, they were strong, but uh, I'm still happy. Hank Vogel's telling us there how it was, but what about Magnus Baxter, I bet he's happy. 
Magnus, that was your first experience with Paris-Roubaix today. It's really something special. Marvelous. I love this race. This is, yeah, I'm going to dedicate my life to this race, definitely. It was very tough, though, because you had a lot of GAN riders up there, but Mapei managed to work you over. Yeah, they were too strong today. We couldn't do anything, actually. It's just Ballerini just rode away from me. I was sitting on his wheel and he just rode away from me after a corner. It was a bit slippery. And, uh, yeah, that was it. And then they had uh, Wilfried Peters and uh, Tafi sitting on his wheel. So. I spoke to Hank Vogels after the finish, and he was devastated that Frederick Moncasson hadn't won. He thought that Fred was in a great day. It, Fred looked pretty good, but I don't know what happened. He just didn't get it run good enough for the um, for on the stones. But I mean, it's it's a hard race. It's a lot of you got to have a lot of luck just to be in the right place at the right time. And yeah, it's just a lot of luck and a lot of experience to to be able to do this. You also have to be very strong as well, and you showed today that you're an exceptionally strong man when it comes to riding this kind of race. Well, yeah, I'm I'm kind of good on flat riding, but. Uh, I had a good day today and I, yeah, I wanted to give Fred a chance to, to be up there for the win and um, yeah, I tried my best but uh, I wasn't good enough today. But Happy with the top 10 place? Definitely, this is more than I expected. Well, a great ride it was too, in fact uh, Magnus taking 7th place in the end in his first Paris-Roubaix. And 24th it was for Tom Steeles, but what about Wilfred Peters? A great demonstration by the Mappe team today. Yeah, today was for less, the same like two years before. Uh, I'm happy now uh, in the first uh, three places. It seemed very sad actually at the end of the Arenberg Forest because everyone was talking about Johan Museo. He went down with a crash and then Zanini and everyone thought that it was over for Mape. Yeah, we have, we have uh, very strong riders for this race. Uh, every eight uh, coming to the start was, was strong. And uh, we lose uh, in the Bosphor Valleyers uh, two best riders. We have uh, also uh, six other riders and you see it in the finish. Is it very special for a rider like you to come onto the stadium here knowing that one of your teammates has already won the race? Yeah, I was happy now uh, when uh, Ballerini was going and uh, me and Taffy was uh, for second and third, third place and uh, you see the people here, uh, it's unbelievable. It was a Saturday though for George Hincapie. George, it was a tough day for everybody out there in the forest today and uh, you looked very comfortable coming out of there. Yeah, I was, I was good in the beginning, first couple of sections, but after the forest I was in a break for a little while and I, after that I just couldn't really recover. And I, I had bad legs after that and I don't know what was wrong, but I just didn't have it today. It was a tough day for everybody and even uh, the Mape lost most of their riders in the forest there. It seemed like absolute chaos. Yeah, it was really hard. Um, I just couldn't recover after the, the farce. You know, I was completely dead. I mean, completely dead. The last hundred kilometers took everything I had just to get to the finish. But uh, another Roubaix. <laughs> I disappointed George Hincapie, who finished 66 with the scars of the battle there. What about Frankie Andreu? Frank, that was a hell of a Paris Roubaix today, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was just all out hard. I mean, uh, I didn't have the great legs today, and today, you had, I mean, any classic, you got to have good legs to be able to do something. But it was just so slippery and muddy, and cra I mean, I crashed three or four times and flatted a couple times. But I probably was staying on the bike. It was, it was one to remember, I guess. <laughs> Both you and George both looked very comfortable in the early sections of cobblestones. You were riding near the front and it seemed to come apart towards the end. Yeah, the critical part was the forest and uh, I, I mean I could tell I was suffering a bit in the first part and I knew it was going to be a long day and then uh, after the forest I was just going and going and going and it was it was too much. You know, I started wearing down I couldn't stand the wheels anymore and then George yeah, ended up having some bad legs later on also and so in the last sections uh, he was really so I stopped I waited for him so we could come in together because it would have been a long day but it was I mean yeah. it was it's a tough I'm surprised race I finished <laughs> it's a tough race it always is and uh, what about that performance by Franco Barali Ballerini winning by four minutes well I mean the way the conditions were it doesn't surprise me I mean it's like if you could get off the front and just ride the guys in the back can only go the same pace as the guy in the front because you go any quicker you're gonna fall off 
I mean, a lot of times when you hit the big mud section, you just have to coast through them. You couldn't paddle because it was too slippery. So, I mean, Ballerini's a strong guy, and, you know, I mean, you had to be strong to win, but time gap, not that big a deal. I mean, once you got the gap, it, you can only go so fast, you know, because it, it, was, it was deadly. Deadly it was, but this man has a much nicer story to tell. Franco Ballerini winning again at the Paris Bay. He's done it twice now. He's going to remember this one because his winning margin was the biggest since Eddie Merckx won this event ahead of Roger de Vlaminck back in 1970. So the Italian really did put an image on the Paris Bay this year, and I hope you've enjoyed this coverage of what has been a real classic in the making. He then had time to stop and see his teammates race home, Andrea Taffy getting second and Wilfred Peters taking the third place. A Mappy 1-2-3 on a day in the very early stages. They lost their two top men, supposedly so, Johan Museo and Zanini. This was the official result. The time for Ballerini just inside seven hours, six hours, 55 minutes and 16 seconds. It wasn't a record, his average speed, a mere 38 and a half kilometers an hour. That's 24 miles an hour over roads like we've seen over the last couple of hours of this videotape. We'll leave you now with some images of one of the great classics that we all had a pleasure to witness. For Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye.